Good morning. Welcome to uh, Spring Valley Bible Church. My name is Chris Day. I will be uh, teaching today for Pastor Herman Maddox. We are <clears throat> glad to welcome you all uh, here today. We will have some uh, fantastic um, opportunity to talk about our summer camp that we just came back from last week and uh, all of the blessings that were, were uh, just showered upon us at camp. And uh, just so excited to be able to talk to you about that today. We will be doing a, a lot of the uh, camp overview at the second um, lesson this morning. So we'll have some slideshows and we'll have some, uh, uh, some songs and uh, just really excited about the opportunity to teach uh, today. <clears throat> there was a request uh, from several people that uh, since I had the opportunity to teach and uh, I wanted to have the I wanted to take the opportunity to teach you all what we teach these kids. And so my wife and I and Larry and Brian and Leslie and Terry, uh, as many of you all know, uh, have been involved with this youth ministry and, and you all as well, um, but just physically involved with them for a, for a number of years and just watching these young people grow uh, has just been absolutely amazing. Um, a 30 second background on myself. Uh, I've, been with Cap I've been with Capital One. Uh, I, I work outside of here at Capital One, um, but I've been with uh, Spring Valley Bible Church and, and under the teaching of uh, Pastor Herman Maddox for uh, about 20 years. Uh, our family came and, and found them here and found him here in Dallas. We've moved around a few places and uh, just have settled in with our church family and our church home right here. So. If you ever, you know, if you're a first-time listener, uh, welcome. And uh, when we do have the opportunity to come back to uh, the physical location, um, we'll show you on the second hour. But it's uh, you can go to Spring Valley Bible Church uh, .com. Is that right, Julie? Spring Valley Bible Church dot org. org. Sorry, don't get that wrong because you'll never find it. Well, Spring well, Valley Bible Church .com too. It will lead to .org anyway. Okay, so Spring Valley Church dot org or com, whichever one you want to do, um, and. Uh, you can listen to all the lessons. You can be involved with this on uh, Facebook Live, which we've really come a long way in our technology. So thank you to, to many folks for doing that. Um, but we uh, we are excited to, uh, at some point, be able to come back in person and all of us be here together as a church family. Uh, we have some folks uh, here this morning, and I, I hope we'll have a few more uh, coming in for the, uh, the second lesson this morning. <clears throat> but uh, that is... Uh, that is a little bit about myself. I'm, this, this conversation and this message is not about me, and so I would like to start with a word of prayer so we all uh, can be in a, uh, in a good place, uh, filled with the Spirit, and allow Him to do the teaching this morning. I'm going to start in our prayer with uh, Psalm 100, which we uh, had the opportunity to hear yesterday. We had a, a family member, uh, an in-law family member that passed away, and her service was yesterday morning, actually Friday morning. And uh, they read Psalm 100, and it just resounded in my heart as, uh, as I was listening to it. So we'll read that this morning to get started, and we'll pray, and then we will uh, get into the lesson. So, um, Psalm 100, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. His people, the sheep of his pasture, enter his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever, his faithfulness through all generations. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just we praise your name. We lift up your son's name to the world and we ask for the strength to be able to go out into the world and give the gospel the good news of what your son did for us on the cross. Your love sent him, his faithfulness died for us so that we may 
spend eternity with you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet in the, to this morning to uh, open your scriptures. We thank you for the, the freedom that we have in this country as we celebrate the 4th of July yesterday. Challenges in this country, Father, but you are God and you are sovereign and you will decide how this all plays out. So we thank you. We praise you. We love you. And we just ask that your spirit will be with us this morning as we open your scriptures, as we open your word and understand the truth. In Christ's name, amen. So one question real quick, Julia, are you getting a lot of my as I'm talking or are we good? Okay, just want to make sure that y'all on the other end of this uh, Facebook Live are, are getting good sound quality because I have boys that will cringe every time they hear the... <laughs> so I want to make sure we're sounding good. So um, at camp, which was actually the 22nd through the 26th of June, uh, we're going to talk, like I said, in the second hour uh, with regards to just all of the amazing things that were happening at camp. Um, watching God work in preparation for camp, watching God work at camp, watching how he impacted these young people, how he impacted the staff, how he impacted me, um, was just awe-inspiring. And, and we'll have a picture in one of our slideshows, in our slideshow, where we look up and God just paints this masterpiece in the sky as we're all gathering together to baptize five kids. Um, and I love the way Carrie says it. Carrie John, uh, Fassel and Carrie were with us, and she just said, you know, he just likes to show off. <laughs> and man, was he showing off in the last, in that week. He just blew our minds, and uh, so excited to tell you all about it. But I wanted to uh, spend a little time in the teaching that we had and, and kind of tell you all so that you understand. You all have been faithful in, in prayer. You're faithful in your financial support. You're faithful in... And whatever you, whatever we need to do to, to make this camp happen, it's not about the camp, it's about these kids. It's, and honestly, y'all, uh, it's about the staff. Because every single one of us, as we walk away at the end of the week, we are so much more filled through that week with those kids and, and just that week of teaching and spending time in worship together. And, and we can take the world and push it away for just a few minutes just for five days, and, and it's just something that just rejuvenates us. It gives us that strength to get back in the, in the battle, and um, it's just amazing. And so it's not just about these campers. It's about the youth, but it's also about every one of us that, is, that are there. And so the teaching that we, we spent a lot of time with uh, over this week was around, um, it, it was focused on John 16, 33. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to John 16, 33. Um, after a full week of, I know it by heart, but I figured it better if I go ahead and turn to it so I don't mess it up. Sorry. And so in John 16, 33, the, the background here is um, Jesus has finished his public ministry. And, and he, his time has come, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. But he has gathered his disciples together. They're going to the upper room. Um, they're they're going to eat that final supper together. He's going to wash their feet. He's going to teach them. He's going to spend time with them. He knows exactly what is coming, right? We all know that he knows. They're still trying to figure it out. I mean, three years of running around public ministry, we got parables and we got teaching. And, and, and I, I love that whole ministry period because it should give every one of us hope in that, guess what? The disciples spent three years with Jesus running around everywhere he went, listening to him, listening to the parables, watching his miracles, bringing people back to life, calming the storms, all of these crazy things that are going on. And they get to the final supper and they still don't understand what's going on. Hallelujah, there's hope for all of us, right? And so um, the final supper has come around and the upper, upper room and, and he's teaching them. He's being extremely clear with what is getting ready to happen. And he says to them at the end of verse, I mean, at the, the end of chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. Take heart. I have conquered this world. 
And that was our entire focus for the week. Um, we decided, now I'm sad, everyone. God decided that this was going to be our verse and our theme for the week last fall. So there was no such thing as COVID-19. Well, it might have been around, but we didn't know what it was. There was no COVID-19. There were no protests in the street. There was no declaring social injustice or social justice or whatever these things are. None of that was relevant at the time. But God put it on our hearts to teach these kids, take heart. In me, you may have peace. You will have trouble. Take heart. Jesus overcame the world. And so um, a couple of points here that I wanted to, to talk about, uh, kind of giving you the, the I want to set a picture so that you all can be a bit of, of live a little bit of camp with us, <clears throat> because I think it's important to, to see the things that are going on. And so we opened our camp with music worship, <clears throat> and then we moved at the, uh, okay, got it. <clears throat> we, we moved to, uh, went for music worship when the kids got there. So the kids walk in and we've got masks on and we've, we're taking temperatures. And so this was a little bit of an awkward um, reception for them to come in. <clears throat> and we moved them directly from being received. Parents don't get out of the car. Parents, you know, stay in the car, answer the questions on this, this sheet that they needed to look at and to make sure that we're all safe, right? We wanted to make sure everybody was safe. And so when we got them out of their cars, we took them over into the worship center and the music starts playing. And now you got to recognize that these are kids that have been tied up in their houses with their families, with their, with their brothers and sisters for months. And we get in there and the band starts playing and the music worship starts playing and the music starts to get loud and the excitement is going on. And we all were a little worried about overstimulation. Um, well, there was definitely overstimulation, but it was amazing. It was absolutely incredible to see these kids just come alive, to be let loose and being let loose into the worship of, of our God. And it was, it was awesome to see. And then we went from there to an escape room. And if you've all done an escape, if anybody's done an escape room, it's an activity where they have to figure out how to, uh, how to find all the clues, find the, the right parts and pieces, how to get out of the escape, and how to escape the room and where they're gonna go. And so we did this uh, escape room and we, we made an escape from the upper room. So this whole week was, was kind of around, wrapped around the upper room. Uh, and because the direction that we, they were given in order to go to this escape room and get out is follow Jesus. So the, the clues were in the Bible. The clues were in washing of the feet. The clues were in all kinds of different things that, that they need to figure out. They got there and they're introduced to Jesus and his disciples are no longer here. Where did they go? And at the end of this escape room, uh, like I said, I'm just painting this picture for you, but at the end, they're all struggling, trying to figure out how to get out of the escape room, find the clues, where to go, get their shirts, get their journals, all these sorts of things. And it was just really fun to watch. And then they headed over to the cross because the end, the, where the escape room led them from the upper room was to the cross. And so they're following Jesus. They're following Jesus to the cross. So picture all of this that's going on. <clears throat> And, and so we started talking about um, the upper room, and we gave them the overview of, this, of the upper room. And, and Jesus, as I said before, Jesus' public ministry was over at this point in time. He's in the upper room. He's with his friends. He's with people that he adored. He's with people that he um, they loved very much. And he was focused on them. The beautiful part of the scriptures is not only was he focused on them, Jesus knew what was coming. He was focused on us. And so we were given the scriptures. We were given the message, the, the intimate conversation that he had with his disciples in the upper room before he goes to the cross. And what a blessing that is. If you've ever spent any time, I know Herman has taught, you know, we laugh syllable by syllable, word by word. <clears throat> Go back and read what happened in the upper room and, and look at it from a, a, just see the scene 
and feel the love that was was there. Um, so Jesus was focused on his friends and the disciples. He was teaching them by washing their feet. You know, in, in verse, I mean, in chapter thirteen, he he spent the time to to wash their feet and explain to them what he was doing and and helping them understand that that he is going to wash away their sins. All their sins will be will be taken care of, and and he's washing their feet to restore them, and and he encourages them. <clears throat> In uh, John 14, 1, so if you back up a couple of pages in your, in your Bible, John 14, 1, as, as he's teaching and he's gotten through the, uh, uh, the understanding of the washing of the feet and the new commands that are given, right? And I'm not going to redo all of this stuff. I, I'm, I'm getting to a place where I want you all to, to where the message is going to come through, but I want you to understand the backstory and, and understand the context in which we're talking <clears throat> and so in, in verse chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. And so he he's... He's continuing to teach them in the most beautiful, loving manner of understand it's not about what's going on here. Believe in me. Believe in my Father. He talks about faith. You know, believe, trust, understand that I know what's going on. You've seen the things that I can do. You know who I am. I'm going to prepare a place for you. So he very quickly switches from, you know, all this crazy that's going to happen coming up to this is where I'm going. He takes their focus from the here and the now and the world and the, the pain and the suffering that he knows they're going to go through. He knows he's going to go through and immediately he switches it to, but I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's home. And so their focus can be shifted from, from the here and now and the pain and the suffering to this is what I've got and I will come back for you. And think of that message as, as trouble is going on around here. <clears throat> we get so focused on, on all the things that are happening here in this world that oftentimes we lose our focus on the fact that he's prepared a place for us. We're, of, we're not of this world. We're in this world. We're of heaven. We are of Christ. We are in Christ. And so we spoke about some of that <clears throat> and then in John 14, 25, he goes on to talk about, <clears throat> don't do that. Okay, note to self. Um, he goes on in, chap in uh, John 14, 25, he's talking about the coming of the Spirit. So not only is he, is he telling them, I'm going to prepare a place, I will come back, but while I'm gone, I'm going to send the Spirit. I'm going to send the Spirit of God down to live in you, to indwell in you, to, to guide your steps, to, to give you the strength and the courage to move on in this troubled times, in this troubled world. Um, there's so much to cover in so many places we could go in the upper room. And I know uh, if, you, if you're interested in, <clears throat> in the in-depth study, by all means, please go to springvalleybiblechurch.com. That's hard.org. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> Please go to springvalleybiblechurch.org and uh, you can listen in depth to, to the study of the book of John. And it's an amazing study. But I want to start with, um, we had three main points as we went across uh, the week. And the first one was fear not. And what was he telling? In me you may have peace. Don't have fear. In me you can have peace. You may have peace. Fear not. And so, if you would, turn with me to Mark, uh, the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35. And I want to read this again. I, when, when you're teaching young people, actually, when you're teaching anybody, the more you can paint a picture, uh, for me, anyway, the more I can paint a picture, the more I can remember it. So I'm very visual. So I want to paint this picture for you. Uh, in chapter 4, if you do, go to verse 35, this is where the disciples <clears throat> were focused on fear not. And this is where the disciples had, uh, 
that have been sent out into the sea by, by Jesus, with Jesus. All right? And so I'm going to read uh, chapter 4, verse 35, and I'll read through 41 if you'll follow along with me. On that day when evening had come, he, meaning Jesus, told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd, and they took him along since he was in the boat. So Jesus is in the boat with them. And other boats were with them. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. Actually, they were awfully, they were in fear as of respect of the awe of the Lord, is that word? And asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So to paint this picture a little bit, um, his public ministry is, is going on. Right, and this is this is at the uh, the end of a day of teaching, and there's lots of parables that he had been teaching, and and remember that a majority of what he was teaching was done in parables during his public ministry because of, and, and miracles because of the fact that those that will want to see will see, and those that don't want to see, it will not make sense, and so the disciples are following him around. They want to see what's going on. They they believe in who he is. They're trying to understand, but there's still so much that they don't get i.e. us, right? There's still so much that we don't get. And so he, he tells them after a day of teaching, let's go over to the other side of the sea. And so they left the crowd. He gets in the boat, and I'm picturing this, right? Now, I want you all to understand that this is not a boat. Like, my wife and I uh, were in the Navy, and we had, Lori was on a 900-foot ship. I was on a 300-foot ship, right? She was on an aircraft carrier, and she was on a 300-foot ship as well, but big. I mean, we were talking massive ships and we were in some serious storms. You know, the front end of an aircraft carrier starts doing this kind of stuff and, and you know you're in a serious storm, right? And and I was up in the North Atlantic in, in 20 flat, 28 foot seas on a, air, on a destroyer and man, we're taking green water over the bow and it's scary. And we were on a 300 foot, 900 foot ship. And so this was not what they were on. Right, they, they, they didn't go get on their aircraft carrier or their, their 80 foot yacht that's got all the right safety equipment. They're on a wood, picture this, a wooden boat, you know, single mast, they got a sail off the side that's probably flapping around in the wind. And, and Jesus gets in the back, lays down on a cushion and goes to sleep. They go out to sea and the winds kick up. And in a small boat, when the winds kick up, the front starts going like this, and they start rocking like this, and the next thing you know, water starts coming over the sides, and the water starts coming in. As the water starts coming in, uh, y'all, it's scary. It's scary on a 300-foot ship. I can imagine they had to have been totally panicked when they're sitting here. I mean, I can picture this. I can see me in that spot, looking back, going, what's he doing? Right? Why? Jesus is in the back. He's asleep. What? Where? And, and frantically trying to trying to get the water out, right? I can see them with buckets and just doing everything they can to get the water out of the boat because once that water gets deep enough to where the, the sides of the boat get below the waves, you're swimming. You're no longer in a boat, right? You might be in the boat, but you're swimming. Um, and so picture this as the disciples, a full day of the teaching and, and just wonderful day with Jesus and they get out onto the sea and and the winds kick up. A great windstorm arose and the waves are breaking over the boat. The boat's taking on water and it's getting ready to be swamped. And in the stern lays Jesus. That's what it says right here. He's in the stern sleeping on a cushion. And so they turn around and they wake him up. Jesus, get up. And they didn't just, hey, Jesus, can you, can you, you know, they calmly come to him and, hey, you're the, you're the creator, you're the sovereign. Can you calm things down? We're getting a little nervous here. They're panicked. 
totally panicked. And I mean, the water's going, waves are crashing. And then he just looks at them. He gets up, and, and I, I think of the movie, The Titanic, right? And I can see Jesus walking to the front. You know, the, the woman on the front's like, oh, I'm on top of the world, kind of thing. And Jesus just walks to the front, stands up at the bow of the boat. It's crashing around like this. I, I, want, I often wonder whether he had any balance issues in this boat, because when you're on a ship that's rolling like that, man, you're flying all over the place. But I, I just can see him just kind of calmly walking to the front. Silence. And it's just like that. <coughs> Silence. Be still. And immediately, I, I'm thinking the disciples are watching this, and they're like, whoa. I mean, this had to have been absolutely awe-inspiring and a bit humbling, I would assume, especially when he turns to them when the wind has ceased and there's a great calm. <clears throat> and think of the storm and then picture a lake where the wind has just gotten completely still. Maybe in the morning there's a little bit of fog coming off of it and it's just totally still. And think of that peaceful picture in your mind as Jesus has said silence and it's gone from total chaos to total calm. Then he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were in awe. The word terrified here doesn't mean they were terrified of fe at fear at this point. They were terrified. It's a different word than earlier when they were afraid. <clears throat> they were terrified. They were in, in awe. They were feared in respect for the Lord at this point. And they asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. And they're understanding who it is that they're with. They knew it. They, they academically knew who he was. They had seen what he could do. But they're in fear for their life. And now they know who he is. And so... <clears throat> couple of things to point out as we talk about this. <clears throat> First of all, who sent them into the sea? Jesus sent them into the sea. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. When he laid down in the back of the boat, it wasn't surprising when he got woken up and there was a storm going on. Jesus sent them into the sea, right? He sent them out on the boat. And so we are sent into the storm by his authority. We're sent into the storm by God's authority. Whether it's of our own doing from bad decisions and God's discipline, whether as a witness in the conflict, such as Job, if you think about Job, Satan had to get permission before he could touch Job. And God gave him permission. Or whether for our own maturity, such as this passage, you have little faith. Are you going to trust me or are you not going to trust me? He sent them into this storm by his authority. Why we are in the storm is not the point. We need to stop trying to figure it out. Once we're in the storm, there's no reason to go figure out why we're in the storm. The question is, are you going to turn to Jesus and be in panic? Or are we going to turn around to Jesus and say, I trust you. You're in the boat with me. It's not about the storm. We all get so focused on the storm that we forget that Jesus is in the boat with us, that God is with us all the time. And we're in the storm in his presence. God is always in the boat with us. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, you as an individual as your Savior, Jesus is in the boat. In fact, you're in Jesus. And we won't get into the technicalities here um, and the theology, but suffice it to say, you can't lose that. You can't lose the fact that you are in Christ, which means he's in the boat with you. The Spirit of God lives inside of us, every single one of us. It's the indwelling of the Spirit that is with us. God is with us all the time. And that in and of itself should give us total calm, but it often doesn't because we forget. So we're in the storm by his authority, 
we're in the storm in his presence and we're in the storm for his purpose it's not our job to stop the storm i'll go back to verse 39 he jesus got up rebuked the wind and said to the sea silence be still the disciples did not get up and walk to the front and command the seas to be silent. Jesus did. It's not our job to stop the storm. Only God can stop the storm. That should be a huge lift of the burden in the world to us. Because we can't do it. I mean, when we realize that we cannot stop the storm, maybe we'll stop trying to stop the storm. But until we do, we're going to keep going out there frantically trying to figure out how to fix everything. That's the world we live in. That's who we are. That's our pride. That's our arrogance to think that we can go fix everything and we can stop the storms. And what does it do? It creates a much bigger storm in our soul because we get our eyes focused on what's around us instead of our eyes focused on him. When we, when we trust God to stop the storm, our faith points to him and he is glorified. So there's a little couple of words back here where it says, they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat and other boats were with him. Other boats were with him. Jesus is in the disciples' boat, but other boats were around. So it's not just this one 20-foot wooden boat that's out there bouncing around all by itself. There's other boats. Because the crowd wanted to follow him, right? They were wanting to follow Jesus. They wanted to go where Jesus was going. And we sometimes we forget to, you know, there's nothing not important in the Bible. Everything is in there for a reason. And so this really stuck out to me is other boats were with him. And, and this point really came across to me that Jesus was in the disciples' boat, but all those that were around him got to see the same thing. Here's Jesus. I can't go out of the... Sorry. Happened. Here's Jesus standing on the front of the boat, and he says, Silent. Be still. What was everybody else who's running around frantically trying to keep the water out of their boat doing when Jesus is standing at the front saying, Silence. They're watching Jesus. They're watching God work. When that, when that calm hit the sea and everything is calm... Every boat that was around them were looking at that boat. They were all looking at Jesus. When we trust God to stop the storm, our faith points to him, and he is glorified. Had they just sat there and kept, you know, trying to get the water out, trying to get the water out, and working 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 and working, panics and all this kind of stuff, who's being glorified? Nobody. It's their own work. If they would have made it to the other side, they would have been able to pat themselves on the back and say, that was close, man. We almost died out there, but man, aren't we good? But that's not what they were able to do because they might have died out there had Jesus not been in the boat. Only he knows. But he was in the boat, and he stood at the front, and he called it silence, and everybody around him saw it. Everybody saw the calm of the storm. Jesus was glorified. God was glorified. And, and here's where sometimes we all get caught, is the storms are inside of us, right? God may not change the circumstances around us, but if we trust him, he will silence the storm in our soul. And that's the point. Being able to be completely calm and on a, just picture that, that lake where, the, where the, you know, the steam is coming off and it's calm and the sun is rising and, and you're just sitting there watching the amazing work and, and of God and it just calms your soul. How'd you like to live your entire life that way? Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is in the boat. Will we trust him? The raging, so think about when you see that lake and the steam's coming off. The angelic conflict is still going on. The war is still on fire. The crazy is still happening in the world, but your, calm, your soul is calm. What, a, what a, 
amazing witness to the world to be in the middle of total, absolute chaos and be completely calm because Jesus is in the boat. The theology, the Holy Spirit is with us. God is in the boat. They are one. And so we have to trust him in order for the storm to be silenced. When they turned to Jesus, they were in total chaos, but they turned to him. Ye of little faith, they should have never gotten to the point of total, absolute panic. Neither should we ever get to that point. But he didn't ever chastise them for turning to him and asking him to help. That wasn't what he was chastising them for. He was chastising them for the fact they ever got to the place of being in a panic. But anytime we're in that panic, there's only one place to turn, and that's to God. But how about we turn to God before we get to that panic, before we get to the place where we feel like we're going to, you know, everything's going to collapse on us, and we turn to him and just stay calm all the time. Even if the waves were going crazy, if they would have just totally trusted that Jesus is in the boat with them, they wouldn't have cared about the storm because they knew God had it all under control. And so this was the, the primary teaching that we were talking about in John 16, 33, we use this as the fear not, and there are actually multiple uh, uh, days of teaching, which uh, I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes at the next session. But um, go back to John 16, 33 for a moment. If you would, please. And it says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That's conditional. You may have peace. It's your choice. Phil came up and, and was teaching um, the last day and uh, he was talking about take heart, take courage. And he talked about take, uh, which is in this passage as well in a second. It's ours for the taking. Right? You may have peace. God offers it. He tells you how you can have peace. He offers it to us, but we have to decide if we're going to take it. We're going to have to decide if we're going to trust him through it. And so, I have told you these things, Jesus speaking to his disciples, that you told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And here's an absolute statement. You will have suffering in this world. Y'all, we're in the conflict. We spoke, I, I had a beautiful opportunity to spend about 45 minutes with a young man who just had so many questions. And uh, we always start with the gospel because it's funny, be, uh, it's funny that sometimes those that have the questions and like these really off the wall, really deep questions, when you start with the gospel, they haven't really figured that part out yet. So we wanna make sure that we start there. Um, we'll get to the angelic conflict, but let's make sure you're saved first. <laughs> and so uh, I had a beautiful conversation. He was saved. Uh, we, we, he understood the gospel. He believed the gospel. And then we spent 45 minutes talking about the angelic conflict. 17-year-old senior in high school who wants to spend 45 minutes of his rec time, his recreational time, where he could be out going off the blob or he could be out... Uh, swimming or you could be over you know shooting paintball or or all those those fun crazy things that uh, teenage boys like to do and girls but and he spent 45 minutes with me talking about the angelic conflict and opening Ezekiel and opening Isaiah and going to the you know to Job and understanding the questions of Job and and, and the, the relationship between Job going to go into the throne room of God and and God's authority it was amazing. This is the kind of stuff that, I mean, you want to, you want to challenge what you know about the Bible? Teach teenagers. <laughs> because they will ask some of the most incredible questions. Um, and it's a blessing. And, it, and the cool part was, was I was actually teaching the, on Monday and he asked the question about the angelic conflict because I, I brought it up in, uh, as part of the teaching. And all of this going on, that we are in the storm, 
And the part of the storm is the angelic conflict. I mean, this is the, where do these storms come from? It doesn't matter. The, the answer is the same. You know, it's kind of like Herman talking about when you go into the hospital, into the uh, uh, emergency room for a, a gunshot wound, they don't really care how you got the gunshot wound. They need to solve the problem, which is the gunshot room, right? And you'll come back later and you can figure it out. But uh, it was, this was brought up in a, in a, uh, in the teaching and he, he asks me, in front of everybody. So what do you mean that this is the devil's world? Now I had 30 seconds left before my, before my teaching session was over. Cause Oh, by the way, you go over 45 minutes, they will ask amazing questions and spend a lot of time with you, but you go past 45 minutes and they're done. Right. They're like, it's, it's like a clock, um, <laughs> which is, is pretty fun in and of itself. But he asked me within 30 seconds of, of my being done, what do you mean it's the devil's world? And I'm like, oh boy, this is not something I can answer in 30 seconds. So we didn't go into all of it. I kind of gave a, a brief overview. Uh, it took about five minutes, but then I spent that time with him. And so you may have peace, but you will have suffering in this world. This is the devil's world. This is the devil's world. God has given the has provided the authority to the devil to do a lot of things in this world. And his intention is never good. And we will have suffering. It's a guarantee. You will have suffering. You can't avoid it. It says right here, you will have it. But take heart. I have conquered the world. Jesus overcame the world. He overcame the world. He overcame the sin problem. He overcame everything that we need to deal with. He's overcome so that we can have peace in him. We can have peace in the spirit. We can have peace because of our faith. The world continues to go crazy, and we can all watch it today. If we're putting our faith in things of this world, if we're putting our faith and our, all of our effort in the things of this world, we're, all we're doing is bailing out the bucket. All we're doing is taking the buckets and bailing water. Right? We're not calling the storm. And so I'm coming up on my 45 minutes and I'll give you guys the same uh, 45 minute number because that's just what I'm used to teaching to. <laughs> so um, I, I want to talk about the application here for just a second. In, in all of these things for the first day, we were talking about do not fear. The second day we were talking about how much God loves us in the gospel and, and Fassel and Carrie, I mean, Fassel spoke to that and taught that. And it was, it was awesome to go through the Bible and see all the places where, where God just demonstrated his love over and over and over and over again throughout the Bible and then presented the gospel as well. So, um, during that period of time, and then, then Phil comes in on, um, uh, Thursday, and he talks about take heart, be courageous, right? Joy, and, and what that means. But on this first day, when we were talking about do not fear, the application really comes down to when we find ourselves stepping to the front of the boat, right? When we find ourselves walking to the front of the boat, try and, and or we are trying to bail faster and faster and faster to keep the water from swamping us in the boat it's time to put down the bucket and faithfully turn to the lord in today's society y'all we can look around at the christian church and i will point outwardly because sometimes it hurts to point inwardly Watch the Christian church and how hard we are bailing water out of a sinking ship. Stop bailing the water. Stop walking to the front and trying to be the one that calms the seas and be the one that turns to the Lord and says, you've got it. Silence my soul. How amazing would it be? How, what kind of a witness would it be if we walked out into protests and said, God loves you. And that's our protest. That's the only thing that we have to offer is that Jesus Christ came to die for you. Jesus Christ will calm your soul. That's all I have to offer. Paul, I speak nothing but Christ. Maybe it's time to put down the bucket 
and faithfully turn to the Lord. And so in closing, I'd like to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, if you would. First Corinthians 16, 13. The final exhortation. Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. It sums it up. Nothing in here talks about bailing water out of a boat. Be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. So as we look around at our circumstances, as we look around the circumstances in our, our amazing country, re reflect back on these things. In, in verse 14, do everything in love. Help your neighbor in love. Somebody's sick, in love. Somebody's protesting, in love. Somebody disagrees with your philosophy, in love. That's what we're commanded to do. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That's a pretty heavy thing to do, but he gives us the Spirit of God in us to do it. And so, it was an amazing week. We'll close in prayer, but uh, so many people to be thankful for and so many things to be thankful for. We'll touch base on some of those in the next hour. And uh, just want to be thankful that God has allowed us the opportunity to work with these young people for so many years. And we pray that we will have the strength and the ability to, uh, to continue to work with them going forward for as long as as long as God sees fit for us to be a part. So if we uh, if you'll bow your heads in prayer with me, we'll start again in about 30 minutes, 25 minutes? Usually we do at 1045. All right, so 1045, we will pick this up again. So if you are uh, online, you can go get some breakfast. We are gonna do communion. And so uh, you can prepare your communion stuff. Um, and we will be doing that this morning as well. So. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just pray that the message is clear and that the truth will be known. Lord, may, you, may your spirit calm the storm in all of our souls. May we all put down our buckets, put our faith fully in you and share the love you, your son, share the love of your son with this world. And Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the faithful teaching of our pastor and the development of this church. And Father, we know it's not about the building and we know it's not about a person. It's about your son. It's about your spirit. And we praise you. We thank you. We worship you. And uh, we just ask, Father, you give us the strength to go into the world with love. In Christ's name, amen.